I'm L.D. Lumpkin, and this is the story of how God has transformed my life. There was a time back in the day that I was obsessed and dominated by sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I was living in Texas, and I was playing in rock bands, and I was traveling, and I was doing all the goofy stuff that young musicians without a compass do, and uh, doing drugs and all of that stuff. Um, I actually got arrested at a show and uh, placed on felony probation. My drug habit became an addiction uh, that was out of control. Uh, I started selling drugs and manufacturing drugs to sort of pay my habit and pay my legal fees. It got bad enough that uh, the judge, who had given me multiple chances, had told me that he was going to uh, send me to prison for 10 years. And on the morning that I was getting ready to be sentenced for 10 years for all of these crimes and fel uh, felonies, I surrendered to God. I said, God, I'm, I know I'm going to prison. I deserve to be in prison. Um, just be with me wherever I go. And in that moment, somehow, God reached his hand into that mess that was my life and rescued me. I ended up going to rehab again. And I came out, and this time I did the things that was suggested. I went to 12-step meetings. I went back to college. I got a degree in clinical social work, and I started counseling people. In 1995, I came to Lake Havasu to start a drug treatment program at the hospital. And I met the woman who would become my wife. I had kids. I started a private practice. But I felt something was missing. I felt like I'd gone as far as I could in my spiritual life. Uh, so we started going to churches. And we would go from church to church, and I would look for something to, to latch on to. I had grown up in a church that was fundamentalist, rules, it mattered how you looked, not what you did. Nobody ever disclosed anything that they were struggling with. I just couldn't find uh, a, a church where I was comfortable. Uh, so we would go and then stop. And then one day we were driving and my five-year-old shamed me by saying, Dad, how come we don't go to church anymore as we were driving by a church that we had attended? So I'd heard about Calvary, so I took him and I, we started coming on Saturday nights and sat in the back row and uh, started coming regularly and I started hearing things that I'd never heard before in church. Pastors disclosing that they struggled with anger and pride and porn. Calvary helping schools and un, uh, mothers who um, uh, were unwed and, and families in need and loving on people. I had vowed not to be involved in anything, but slowly I got involved here at Calvary in the worship team and life groups and other areas. And, um, you know, I could see where God was calling me to use my position as a counselor to speak into people's lives when appropriate, because I looked at Calvary as a hospital for the hurting. I want to encourage you, you don't have to be a counselor or a pastor. We have lots of hurting people out there, and I, I want to encourage you to look for opportunities to ask people to come to church with you. I promise you, it will be rewarding for you, and we're hopefully that God will speak into their lives through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Well, what, a, what an awesome, awesome testimony about how God is going to put somebody in the worship band, whether they say no or not. I love it. Well, today, if you have your Bible, uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17. If you're using one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you, you can find 1 Samuel 16 on page 282. And if you do not have a Bible that you can read or understand easily uh, at your house, I want to encourage you, take one of our Bibles home with you. Read it and apply it to your life because we do believe that if we read God's Word and apply God's Word, He will absolutely 
absolutely transform our lives. Parker Campus, we want to say welcome. We're so glad that you are with us today. Uh, I want you to know you can hop up right now, run back to the back of Alumni Hall and pick up a Bible if you don't have one. Pastor Reuben will be completely okay with that. On your marks, get set, go. Hurry up. Well, today we are concluding our Transform series. Can you believe that? You were supposed to groan. You were supposed to say, oh, no. Today we're concluding our Transform series. The theme verse for this series has been Romans 12, 2. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And we focused on our lives spiritually and mentally and physically and emotionally. We've looked at many different areas of our lives. And if we were to sum up our workbook, if we were to sum up the challenges from the sermons, you would have over 100 changes to make in your life. We don't want you to do that. We just want you to find one thing that could transform your life. We want you to focus on one application each and every week. And hopefully, prayerfully, you have experienced God transforming your life. Uh, I, I want to share with you a couple ways that God has been transforming my life over the last seven weeks. Has God been transforming your life? All right, good. Well, so physically, even though the, the message was on stress, I understood I needed to eat a little bit more healthy. And so I've actually dropped 11 pounds because I've been applying. That's good. I'll take it. I need the encouragement because I got birthday cake in the back. <laughs> and, and spiritually, now I, I know that a pastor should not confess this to you, but I fell out of the habit and routine of spending daily time with God. I used to wake up early in the mornings uh, back before we had children and uh, wake up early in the mornings, read my Bible, pour my heart out to God and drink some coffee. And I've fallen out of that habit. And so since January 26th, I've been up at the morning, every morning at 4.40 a.m. I get the coffee going. I sit down with the Bible at the kitchen table and I pour my heart out to God because I remember the prodigal son, how God just welcomed him back spiritually. And uh, so I want to encourage you, whatever ways you are being transformed, understand God is going to continue to transform your life. So raise your hand if God has transformed your life in one or two areas since we began this series. That's awesome. That is awesome. And I know that God is going to continue to transform our lives because that's what he does. God is not content with just leaving us on our own. He wants to continue to transform your life and my life. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most well-known Old Testament stories, I think, that uh, anybody has ever heard. We're talking about David and Goliath. Raise your hand if you heard about the fight with David and Goliath. Who wins? Spoiler alert. Well, now I don't even have to preach the sermon. You can go home. Thanks for playing. You can find the account in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17. So I want to give you a brief summary of these two chapters. Now, Jesse was an Israelite and he had eight sons and his youngest son was David. When David was a boy, the prophet Samuel uh, recognized that God had chosen David to be the king of Israel. And so in front of David's dad and his brothers, Samuel anointed David to be the future king and the king. So at that time, the Israelites were at war with the Philistines. Jesse, David's dad, sent his three oldest sons into battle and he sent the king of all of Israel that God had recognized back into the fields to take care of the sheep. For 40 days in a row, a champion of the Philistines walked to the front of the battle lines and he, his name was Goliath and he would stand at the front of the line and he would taunt the Israelites and they would shake and quake in fear. Goliath was about nine feet tall. He wore armor that weighed about 150 pounds and he terrified the Israelites with one challenge. You bring out your best man to fight me. If he wins, we go home. You defeat us. If I win, we defeat you. So one day, Jesse, 
David's dad sent David back out to the front lines because he wanted to find out how his brothers were doing and take them some food. So while David was there, Goliath marched out to the front line and he taunted the Israelites and David was amazed that none of the Israelites accepted the challenge. In fact, he began to question, why isn't anybody accepting the challenge? What's going on? What is the reward that King Saul has offered? And so as he began to ask around, he decided that he himself would go out and he would fight Goliath. Now, David was a boy. He was a scrawny, scrappy, skinny little boy. When King Saul, who was the king of the Israelites, heard about David's uh, desire, he tried to discourage him. And David insisted to the king, I can do this. So Saul gave him his personal armor. He put it on that little boy, and it was too big for him. It weighed him down. He gave him a sword. He gave him a shield. It was too heavy for him. So David dropped it down and said, I don't need this. He went out, found uh, five stones, put them in his sling, and went out to fight Goliath. He spun the sling around. He hit uh, Goliath right in the head with a rock. Uh, Goliath fell down. David grabbed Goliath's sword, ran over, chopped off his head, and there was much rejoicing by the Israelites. That's the end. So there's the spoiler, right? In case you were sitting on the edge of your seat and you didn't know what happened, there is the story. Now, most of us, as we think about how this applies to our life, most of us have hopes and dreams that other people tell us can never happen. Uh, maybe it could be at work. Maybe you've got an idea that if your boss would just implement, it would revolutionize the world. Maybe you have incredible dreams about your future. While we may not face a nine foot tall giant that wears 150 pounds of armor, you and I still face giants in our lives almost every single day. And they stand there and they taunt us and they try to defeat us. Before David could defeat Goliath, there were four other giants that he faced in his life. Before he ever got the recognition for killing Goliath, he had to defeat some other giants. And these giants are common for you and I today. Like David, we all face giants of delay, discouragement, disapproval, and doubt. We're gonna leave that up there for a little bit longer because there's four blanks. We all face giants of delay, discouragement, disapproval, and doubt. And maybe you have faced some of those giants already if you've tried to allow God to transform your life. Maybe there have been some uh, giants that you faced over the last seven weeks. You see areas of your life that you want to change, but there are these giants that are standing in the way. The first one I wanna talk about is delay. Before he could battle Goliath, David first had the battle of delay. Think about this. The prophet Samuel had come and anointed David as the king of Israel. He's supposed to be on the front lines. He's supposed to be making decisions. The throne of Israel is his. Instead, daddy sent him out into the field to take care of sheep. There was a delay, there was a lag. He had this dream now that he had been anointed as king. He'd been chosen by God to be king and instead he's out in the fields with the sheep. There are going to be things that stand in your way. There are going to be things in your life. There are going to be people in your life that create delay and maybe it is a family member. In David's case, it was his daddy. He said, no, you're not king, you're shepherd. Get out there, boy. Go take care of the sheep. You're not king. He's crazy. That's a crazy old man. Some people are delayed because of their age. I remember being too young to do certain things, and now I'm 48, and I'm too old to do certain things, right? Some people are held back because of their gender. Some people are held back because of their, uh, their race. Some people are held back because of their past. Unfortunately, that happens. People don't let you overcome your past, and so they tell you you can't do certain things. Maybe you've been held back because you weren't pretty enough, you weren't smart enough, you weren't educated enough, you weren't good looking enough. Maybe you've been held back for some other reasons. 
And the sad truth is, like in David's case, it's sometimes the people that have held you back the most from pursuing your dreams and pursuing those God-sized goals that he has put in front of you. Sometimes it's the ones that love you the most that say, no, 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 you can't do that. The second giant that David faced before he could fight Goliath was that, that giant of discouragement that stood in his way. Goliath, this giant, had created a culture of fear and discouragement among the Israelites. Every day for 40 days, Goliath stood out there and said, come on, bring it on. And he was going against the entire Israelite army and they all would run away in fear. Day after day, he taunted them and they just ran away. They were demoralized. They felt hopeless. They were gripped with anxiety. They couldn't see victory because all they saw was the giant standing in front of them. They couldn't see beyond the giant. They couldn't see the win that God had for them. They could only see the giant and they were discouraged. The entire Israelite army were convinced that Goliath could not be defeated. But one young, skinny, scrawny little boy knew that God could use him to defeat the giant as plain as day. If you are unable if you're not able to see past the giant of discouragement in your life, you will never become the person that God has created you to be. If you're easily discouraged and you can't see around it and you can't see past it, you will never become the person that God is transforming you to be. The third giant that David had to face was that disapproval the disapproval giant. When David's older brother heard that David was asking questions about, hey, why, why aren't the Israelites going out there? Why, is there nobody that's going to challenge him? When his older brother heard about it, Eliab said to him in verse 28, why have you come down? And with whom have you left the sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. David's own brother disapproved of him being there. Why are you even here? Go back home. You're useless here. Go back and take care of the sheep. Now, here's the deal. Most of us want people to like us. We, I want to be liked. I don't know about you. Most human beings want to be liked. We want to be accepted. We want people to approve of what we do. But understand this. If you decide to go after God's dream for your life, if you decide to go after the transformation that God is at work, uh, that God is working in your heart, there will be people around you who do not approve of the choices that you're making. There will be people in your life who will criticize you. They won't understand what you're doing. They might even attack you and attack your character and bring up your past. There will, be, there will be people who just don't get it and just judge you for it. When I began to speak about my childhood story of abuse and I began to, to talk about it and I began to lead conferences and be guest speakers and had a website, my brothers and sisters and my aunts and my uncles did not approve. Essentially it was, that's a family secret and you don't go telling everybody about it. And yet everywhere I went, I would see gobs of students and adults surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. They would receive forgiveness for their sins. They would forgive their parents for whatever dysfunction was going on in their house. I'd see fathers and children reconcile. It was amazing, but I didn't have the approval of my family. And then I wrote a book and I didn't have the approval of my family. And then CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network, put a little video testimony of mine that went, that aired nationally. And I did not have the approval of my family. See, if, if you have a desire to use your place of work or, or to use the, where you're at in life to offer hope and offer forgiveness and offer joy and to communicate the good news of Jesus, if you have that desire, people around you are going to disapprove. People around you are going to shake their heads. 
And you've got to learn to be okay with that because God's approval matters so much more than man's approval. Now, there's a fourth giant that you're going to face in life before you stare down Goliath. There's a fourth giant that David had to face before he stared down Goliath, and that's doubt. Doubt. When David finally got some face time with King Saul, uh, David said in verse 32 and 33 of chapter 17, don't worry about a thing, King Saul. I got this. I'll fight this Philistine. He didn't say I got this. I added that. He said, don't worry about a thing. I'll fight this Philistine. And Saul, the king, said, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can go against this Philistine. You're only a boy and he's a professional warrior and has been a professional warrior all of his life. So here's the king, the leader of Israel, right? The, the king, the expert, the king who'd been victorious in battle after battle and he led his people in battle after battle looking at David and said, there's no way you can beat him. Let me just say something. When the experts create doubt in your mind about what God is leading you to do, remember, experts are not always right. Sometimes the experts are wrong. You don't have to listen to the experts. Now, I think it's wise. I think it's wise counsel. But when God is leading you to do something and everyone's telling you you can't, look at the life of David who said, Oh, yes, I can. I can do this. So how do you defeat giants that are keeping you from becoming the person of God that he's transforming you to be? How do you reach those dreams? How do you reach those God-sized goals in life and work? How do you overcome delay? Well, really, you can't, can you? How do you overcome uh, discouragement? How do you overcome disapproval of others? How do you overcome doubt? Well, you do four things. First, remind yourself of God's help in the past. Remind yourself of God's help in the past. In verses 36 and 37, uh, Saul doubted David's ability, uh, David's ability to beat Goliath. And he said, you're just a little boy. Uh, sorry, that was in verse 32 and 33. And then in 34 through 37, David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, meaning me. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after that lion or bear and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard and I struck him and I killed him. He said, your servant has struck down both lions and bears and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. I love the courage that David demonstrated here. Remember who he was. He was a boy. And yet he's standing before the king, putting his faith in God. And he's saying, I will go defeat that Philistine. God has helped me in the past. I grabbed that lion. I grabbed that bear. I clubbed it to death. And I'm going to do the same to Goliath. I love that. Let me ask you a question. Metaphorically speaking, do you remember a time when you had to grab a lion or a bear by the jaw and club it to death? Do you remember a time when God defeated a giant in your life, a way that God helped you in the past? Do you remember a time when you thought you wouldn't make it? Do you remember a time when you just were overwhelmed spiritually and you felt like you were in such a dark hole and a dark valley and you felt alone and God brought you through it, didn't he? That's why many of you are here today because God has already brought great victory to you in the past and he still cares for you. And since he brought you great victory in the past, he's not going to abandon you in the future. 
See, if you want to defeat giants in life and work, you have to remember and believe God has helped you in the past and he's going to help you again because God never, ever changes. He is still the same as he was yesterday, today, and forever. We have a God who doesn't lie or deceive. We have a God who fights for us and who loves us unconditionally. He doesn't love you one day and ignore you the next day. If God has helped you in the past, even in little ways, he's going to help you in the future in big ways. Now, another tip to defeat the giants, uh, remind myself to use the tools that God has given me in the present. Use the tools that God has given you in the present. In verse 38 through 40, uh, King Saul had said to David, hey, look, if you're going to face the giant, boy, put on my armor. Use my sword. Take my shield. David knew those tools were not his. David knew God had not provided those tools for him. Why? Because he put them on and he couldn't move around in them. He put them on and they confined him. He knew there was no way he would be able to fight the giant using somebody else's tools. So he looked around and he found five smooth stones and he put them in his sling and he went out and he took care of the giant. Now, sometimes when God gives us a dream or God gives us a goal or God gives us this idea, this epiphany, this moment where we say, yes, that is exactly what God wants to do in my life. Sometimes we immediately identify the things that we don't have to do it. I don't have enough money, God. I don't have enough education. I don't have enough connections. I don't have enough opportunities. I don't have this. I don't have that. And if you're going to chase those God-sized dreams that God has given you, you cannot wait for something you don't have. If you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get started in walking by faith. That's what faith is. Faith is the evidence of things not yet seen. When God births an idea, when God leads you to be transformed in an area, take that step of faith. You don't know where you're going. You don't know if you have the tools, but you have the creator God on your side. Never say, someday I'll get started on it because someday is never, ever going to come. Today is the day to get started on transforming your life if you've not yet done that. Today is a day to come down at the close of our service and surrender your life over to Jesus by talking through one of our prayer team. Today is the day to begin that journey of faith. Don't wait. Be obedient and do what God has given to you. Third, ignore the dream busters. Ignore the dream busters. Years later, David was the recognized king of Israel. Years later, he's an adult. Years later, he's married and he has wives and he has children. Years later, he's leading his army and another army invaded their land and burned down houses while the Israelite army wasn't there. And they carried off their wives and they carried off their children. The soldiers that followed David at that point became bitter. They got upset. Their wives are dead. Their children are dead or carried off into captivity and David had led them somewhere else. They got bitter in their hearts and they began to talk about stoning David. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 30, verse six, that when others were speaking against him, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Isn't it interesting what David, in moments when he needed encouragement, that he received none. David's going to take on the giant and everybody else is scared to death to take him on. He didn't get any encouragement from anybody. His daddy didn't encourage him. His mama didn't encourage him. His brothers didn't encourage him. The Israelite army didn't encourage him. King Saul didn't encourage him. And then years later, as an adult, his men are talking about stoning him when he needed encouragement. So David encouraged himself 
in the Lord. If you're going to go after your dream at work, if you're going to go after your dream in life, you have to learn how to encourage yourself because sometimes nobody else is going to be standing around you encouraging you. Sometimes nobody else is going to believe in you and what God is leading you to do. So you have to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. Well, pastor, what does that look like? It looks like sitting down at a kitchen table with a cup of coffee and a Bible and pouring your heart out to God and talking to God about your dreams and talking to God about your future and talking to God about your past and your present. Encourage yourself in the Lord. It means you stop believing what other people say about you and you begin to believe wholeheartedly what the Bible says about you. And finally, expect God to help for his glory. Expect God to help for his glory. Now, I gotta tell you, I love this story of David and I love, 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 love what he said to Goliath when he went out and stared down Goliath. This boy staring at this nine foot, 150 pound armor, sword, shield bearer in front of him. David looked at him and said to the Philistine in 1 Samuel 17, verse 45, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. Man, what a tiny mouth of faith, right? What an incredible statement to make. My God is gonna take you out. David fought Goliath expecting to win. Do you expect God to bring victory into your life? Do you expect God to bring a win against those goals that he has put in your heart? Do you know God is for you and God expects you to have that faith to believe in him that you will be more than a conqueror through what Christ has done what are you expecting God to do in your life? Every time God works a miracle in scripture, it's because somebody believed that God was going to do it. Jesus said in Matthew chapter nine, because of your faith, it will happen. In Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus said, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing will be impossible. Now look, God loves you enough to, to do something for you. He loves you enough to give you the freedom to choose to allow how much of God you want in your life. He gives you enough freedom to choose the amount of faith that you're going to put in God. It's based on how much you choose to trust him. Have you trusted him with your dream? Better yet, have you trusted him with your life? Have you received forgiveness for your sins by taking a step of faith and surrendering your life to Jesus and experiencing forgiveness and being born again? See, that's your first step of faith. You take that step of faith first. And our prayer team will be here at the close of the service after the last song. They would love to help you become a follower of Jesus and help you take that next step of faith. But it requires you to move forward, you to step out, to walk down and to say, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. I want to encourage you Expect God to help you win. Expect God to help you walk through valleys of darkness. Expect God to help you face giants in your life and God will move. Let's pray together. Father, we love you.
and we want to say thank you for what you did in the life of David. Thank you for the fact that you used David to slay a giant. And thank you that faith can slay giants in our lives as well. Lord, we invite you to continue to work in our hearts, continue to change us into the men and women you've created us to be. We turn this service over to you once again. We invite you to change us. We love you, and it's in Christ's name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen.